pleasant good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to welcome you all to the Caribbean Sepsis Alliance first webinar that we are having on the World Sepsis Day, Friday 13th of September 2024. We are very, very fortunate today to have in our presence Dr. Kandaraman Krishnamurti, Dr. Marikita Gittin St. Hilaire, and Dr. Aldit Buckland, who are very well renowned scientists in their own rights and who will be giving us some information on this. I am Sandeep Maharaj, the Interim Director, well, the Director of the School of Pharmacy at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Campus and the Interim Founding CEO of the Caribbean Sepsis Alliance. And today, I will not waste too much time because we're already running a bit short on time and introductions. And we'll first like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Kandaraman, Krishnamurti, who is a consultant pediatric intensive care unit specialist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital Barbados, also a senior lecturer at pediatrics at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, Cave Hill, uh, the University of the Western East, and Michael Barbados, who is going to take us through the topic, recognition of sepsis in pediatric patients. Dr. Kandaraman, straight over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Maharaj um, and uh, TUB team and the Caribbean Sepsis Alliance. Pleasant good morning to all. Let me share my slide. Right, just um, pediatric sepsis. We are just going these at the agenda. An introduction on sepsis and early recognition of sepsis. A little bit of epidemiology of the census or mortality and the screening tool and the golden hour and what is a hospital setting? How do you guys manage and collaboration and communication and pitfalls of sepsis management? Before we get in there, so just. Um, listen to this three minutes video and you know how, what sepsis in pediatrics. Megan's story. Every family's experience of sepsis is different. We'd like to share some of their journeys with you. My daughter Megan became a world in November last year. I remember it's around Halloween actually and we had to sit out the trick or treat both her brother and herself were sick, just sort of had cold-like symptoms. Uh, Megan in particular was running a temperature, but it was nothing different to what we dealt with in the past, just sort of extended into a fourth day. And just sort of the instincts kicked in at that point. And we just thought, gosh, this is something different that we're dealing with, that she used to go to, to ED. But I mean, the night before that she went to the hospital, she was actually dancing around really happy, like you wouldn't have known that it was as serious as it was. I think what really prompted us to take her to ED was that um, we saw a change in her condition that morning. Um, so she had pain in her chest. She started going floppy. She was okay in the car. She was sitting up. I drove her there. She actually walked herself into the emergency department. The whole time in my head, I was thinking they're going to turn us around. They'll be like, <laughs> she's just got a cold, like just, you know, fever. She just got home sort of thing. We saw the doctor and then really from there, she just sort of started to go downhill when she was being examined. Your daughter's very sick. She's very sick. She's very, there was no, and you're sort of waiting, yeah, but she'll be okay. So there was no but. So we still didn't know at that point that she, what we, what, that she had sepsis. We didn't even, we didn't find that out until uh, when we got upstairs. Yeah, I just remember the, one of the consultants showing me the scan of her lungs. The consultant said she is the sickest child in intensive care. She was in a coma, I think, for about six days in ICU for 12 days. We went into a ward after that for 10 days and we were in, a, in the hospital for a total of three weeks. It's, yeah, it's scary. I guess you're you know that they're, she's in the right spot as well. I mean, it's it's scary, but it's also comforting in a way that you know that, you know, that they've escalated it so quickly. They're all very aware of, of the signs and listening and, and what we thought. That was very keen to hear what we thought about where she was, what how sick she was and her condition. So I think that was it's also played a part in how quickly and how well she came back from it. Trust your instincts completely. Just, you know, if something's wrong and something's not right, just, you know, kind of trust your instincts and, and take, take your child to ED. I think most parents are 
always concerned that they don't want to be the one that overreacts and takes their child in when they're not really sick. You know when something's wrong. You don't need to diagnose, but you know there's something different. It's so amazing to see it now, but such a tra traumatic time. Everyone's experience of sepsis is very different. If you'd like to learn more about sepsis, please visit our website. Right, so listen to the Megan story. So she, the Megan was in the right time and right place in a tertiary care hospital in ED. And in spite of that, the sepsis has devastating complications for her and then she has been saved. So the sepsis just in one hour can deteriorate and go on to multi-organ failure. So what are the factors in sepsis? Child who have been previously had sepsis before, it's double or triple times high, the chances can have sepsis again. And of course, the newborn babies and the young infants and patients, the kids who has immune system, low immune system, is on steroids or is on oncology and chemotherapy patients, patient who has recent surgery, child who have burns, and of course, long-term illness, the kids who had neuromuscular disorder or, cerebral, or bedridden cerebral palsy, quadriplegic cerebral palsy, or patients who stayed in a long admissions in the hospital. Could this be sepsis? What are these signs? So, respiratory rate, breathing faster, struggling to breathe. Sometimes there is a pause in breathing. Skin is cold and clammy, mottled, pale. You have any specific rash, blanched for a rash, fades on pressure, drowsiness, confusion, irritability, of course, restlessness and floppy. So unable and unwilling to walk, have abnormal movements or seizures, pain in the neck, specific chest, or even in pain on joints, unable to drink, pause, not able to keep the fluids down, quasi vomiting, diarrhea, and decreased uh, urine output. What is pediatric sepsis? It's a serious condition where the body responds to the infection becomes dysregulated, leading on to widespread inflammation and organ dysfunction. It affects various age group from newborn, infancy, children, up to the adolescents. What is common etiology? Infection, which is the bacterial, of course, viral and fungus, even protozoa. Unlike in adults, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome criteria that are traditionally used, it's pediatric sepsis is now defined based on the organ dysfunction than the inflammation. This is a set of organ dysfunction definitions from two, in 2016, pediatric sepsis three definition, which is mainly focusing on organ dysfunction than the inflammation. Third international consensus definition of sepsis and septic shock now based on three, right? One is the organ dysfunction, other one is dysregulation of the host response and threat to life. Of course, the third one is basically organ dysfunction and dysregulated host response. One is the organ dysfunction, usually the pediatric sequential um, organ failure spool, and the dysregulation home response is the infection, suspected infection. These two combine together threat to life. Coming to the shock, the child might straight away present to you in shock with delayed presentation, or this shock that is no or warm, warm shock and cold shock terminology has been removed. Based on the vascular resistance, the increased vascular resistance, capillary refill is greater than three seconds, weak peripheral pulse, small, cold, skin is cold and mottling, narrow pulse pressure, whereas this is shock with the decreased systemic vascular resistance, flash capillary refill, bounding peripheral pulse, warm to touch, wide pulse pressure with low diastolic pressure. Of course, cardiogenic shock, this is a dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia with murmur. You might see commonly in children with a upper respiratory tract infection can turn out to be viral myocarditis. So impact on children's health, one is the mortality, long-term effects on the hospital burden. The mortality, it's almost 85% of the pediatric sepsis is under five. It's so the commonest cause of death in hospitalized children. Long-term effects, children will have physical and cognitive and emotional challenges. Of course, healthcare, healthcare burden, sepsis is most expensive condition, especially when you treat in the ward or in an intensive care setting. The cost is so high and also affects the families and other healthcare system. This is a study which we did almost like 14, 2014, myself and Professor Hari and Professor Sinjan. This is the evaluation of cost in pediatric intensive care in Barbados. The cost is really high in an ICU setting, which includes it's almost comes around 650 to 850 US dollar per day. So it's early recognition saves the cost. 
What does the statistics say? World WHO says 6.3 deaths per thousand live births among the children uh, under five. Once diagnosed, the case fatality rate is almost pediatric, pediatric sepsis 25%, which is extremely, think about it at this stage. Um, child's vulnerability, of course, the sepsis cases worldwide occurs among under five, as I said before. This data I got it from the Global Sepsis Alliance 2024. Almost 8% of the pediatric sepsis is missed in the emergency department. Of course, um, it's very level of staff, as understaff, training, education, et cetera. The cost of the hospitalized sepsis is almost 25% is high in between 2005 and 2016 with the in after adjusting the inflation, so it's quite high. Average length of sepsis, pediatric sepsis stay is 31.5 days. The child with severe sepsis and septic shock who are being black or Hispanic is more likely to die than the non-Hispanic. This is the latest information which I got from several sepsis guidelines. This is a study from Professor Tex Kisun. He's not here, I believe so. He's one of the um, uh, <clears throat> critical care physicians in Canada who was a founder assisted in getting the Caribbean Sepsis Alliance. He published a data on critical care, journal 2022. These are the primary factors which we need to strengthen, transportation, primary care centers, referral centers, post-discharge mortality and morbidity, and the pre-morbid risk factors. Each and every single point is important to go and strengthen and how do you prevent sepsis. So recognizing pediatric sepsis, very vital is the pediatric early warning score. This is a nursing administrative clinical acuity tool associated with escalator algorithm used to improve the early identification of clinical deterioration in the hospital patients. And it, it, the recent data has been published in Pew score. The out of uh, ICU cardiopulmonary arrest has been dramatically decreased after I started using this Pew score. I think it can be used in both limited resources setting and we have to make it compulsory in our region. This is the chart which we use for the Pew scoring, respiratory rate, SATs, heart rate, blood pressure, and the monitor you do, and there is a respiratory distress, there is a grading system on your left side, and uh, this is the escalation of level, low, medium risk, high risk, and then emergency. So they can identify once the score one to four, five to eight, nine to 12, and greater than 13. So identify and immediately alert the senior person on call. In the NHS, they widely used to this score. And this is John Hopkins study, uh, pediatric sepsis clinical pathway. I just want to highlight that in our region, we should have a Caribbean pediatric sepsis clinical pathway. So early recognition and then move on to the sepsis pathways. Automatically, severe sepsis alert has been triggered and then sensitization of staff. Sensitization of staff, routine, routinely training about sepsis and retraining on sepsis. So that is important. It's not just one-time training. Move on to the hospital setting, inpatient screening, clinical pathways, and few scoring. I just want to reassess the uh, remind you that inpatient screening, which we routinely do, the vitals, laboratory results, the clinical signs of taking blood culture, FDC, CRP, et cetera, and start antibiotics. But clinical pathways should be alerted, so early recognition from the uh, child enters the ER. And then few scoring for the inpatient system, especially in the pediatric ward, uh, medical and surgical ward. Collaboration and communication, which is essential, multidisciplinary meeting and efficacy and communication is important. Handing over, especially, and it's not just if patient comes into the ER, write an antibiotics, and then just leave it. It's you have to communicate with the nurse, come on, this is a high risk patient needs to start the antibiotics ASAP, and the first dose has to be given, which I'm going to highlight on survival substance guidelines to golden hour. This is the golden hour, nice guidelines. There are two guidelines. One is the NHS, which is follows the traffic signal. This is the one with the Sheffield Hospital that I did a locum a couple of 10 years ago, maybe. Yes. Um, febrile child, use on uh, present to you, the ER. Uh, this is the vital stable, respiratory rate, skin color, capillary refill, and activity level. Once everything is fine, move on to the heart rate. Is it abnormal or normal? Once it's normal, is there any risk factors? which we discussed in the first slide. They know sepsis is unlikely once this all know. If heart rate alone is abnormal, observe and then review. If the, any one of the parameters, more than one parameter is abnormal, call the senior. Survival sepsis guidelines, which I said, this is the algorithm which you want to highlight about the septic shock and suspected sepsis. Sus suspected sepsis is, is the three hours, 
whereas the septic shock golden hour, one hour. So ABCs, IV access culture, antibiotics, measure the lactate and fluid bolus and mass active. All these three, six parameters should be done within an hour when the child presents to you in an ER. Of course, following which, continue reassessment and review with the patient. Of course, you have the refractory shock, hydrocortisone, avoid hypoglycemia, appropriate antibiotics and nutritional support. Still getting worse, of course, uh, higher level invasive ventilation and ECMO. This is about vasoactive shock um, uh, when you depends upon the intensive care setting and doesn't have an intensive care setting. If you have a healthcare system without intensive care, abnormal perfusion with hypotension, follow given a bolus and reassess and repeat the bolus and in a fetus septic shock, ideal uh, inotrope will be the norepinephrine. It's the same as the healthcare system with the intensive care setup. But when you see a septic shock, abnormal, per, um, abnormal perfusion without hypotension, then you can just give the fluid maintenance and straight away go for vasoactive pressors. The pitfalls during the pediatric sepsis is the delayed recognition. So early recognition, you can use the scoring system. Of course, over-reliance on cis criteria is uh, not the must. It should correlate with the clinical condition of the patient. Inadequate fluid resuscitation. So after fluid resuscitation, you need to reassess again whether the child needs more fluids. Underestimates of the severity, so ideally try to use the pediatric early warning scoring system. Inappropriate antibiotic selection, again, consider based on the local antibiograms and involved infectious ID specialists if it's available. Lack of interdisciplinary communication, effective communication is important, is vital. Delayed communication can cause a bad outcome. This is more research is required in our region. This is what to highlight of middle and low income countries. So sepsis registry is essential. So probably Caribbean Sepsis Alliance, we can be able to communicate and start this sepsis registry in among our region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc, for a fantastic presentation. And it's very comprehensive of the issues faced in the pediatric population. And we really wish to thank you, Doc, for giving that perspective. I will now like to bring on to the screen Dr. Alden Buckland, who is a general practitioner, a family doctor, a member of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians, has been somebody working and dedicated into the area of planetary health as well. And as we all know, the issues of climate change, health and sepsis, how they are related. And I would like now to invite Dr. Buckland to speak about sepsis in the community setting, a case study. Dr. Buckland, over to you. Please, thanks. Thank you, Sandy. All right, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to present on this topic, sepsis in the community setting, a case study. The Caribbean Sepsis Alliance was formed uh, this year, and we aim to help our region to recognize early sepsis, because in doing so, it saves lives. Next, please. The Global Sepsis Alliance celebrates today as World Sepsis Awareness Day. Sepsis is a global health crisis. One in every five deaths worldwide is associated with sepsis, and survivors of sepsis may face lifelong consequences. Mm -hmm. There are risk groups. In the community, there are risk groups. In the community, we have people with chronic diseases such as lung and heart problems. We have people with no spleen in the community, people with weakened immune systems, for example, AIDS and diabetes. We have children under one in the community and adults over 16. All of these are risk groups for sepsis. So although everyone can get sepsis, certain people are at even higher risk. Next. When people recover from sepsis, that does not mean that everything is okay because many of them may feel sad, they may have difficulty swallowing, they may have muscle weakness, they may have clouded thinking, difficulty sleeping, poor memory, difficulty concentrating, fatigue and anxiety. And that is those who survive it. Those who don't survive it are dead. Very important, prevention saves lives. And during the whole COVID pandemic, we learned about vaccination. People got sepsis from COVID, remember that. 
So vaccination is very important. Using clean water, hand hygiene, preventing hospital acquired infections, safe childbirth, and very important awareness. And that's what today is all about, bringing awareness to sepsis. Prevention does save lives. Next. So if you think you've had an infection and developed any of the following symptoms, you must go straight to the emergency department. Go to your doctor and just ask, could it be sepsis? Could it be sepsis? I want everybody to sing this like a chorus. Could it be sepsis? Sepsis, this is an acronym, S, slurred speech or confusion. E, extreme shivering or muscle pain. Bring into your mind somebody that you have encountered. Slurred speech or confusion, extreme shivering or muscle pain. P, passing no urine in a day. S, severe breathlessness. I, it feels like you're going to die. S, skin mottled, discolored, or very pale. It spells sepsis. Could this be sepsis, what you're going through? What somebody else is going through in your family? Could this be sepsis? Next, please. Any child who is breathing fast, has a fit or convulsion, looks mottled, bluish or pale, has a rash that does not fade when you press it, is very lethargic or difficult to wake, feels abnormally cold to touch, might have sepsis. Any child under five who is not feeding, who is vomiting repeatedly, hasn't had a, pee, a wee or a wet nappy for 12 hours, might have sepsis. And so if you're worried that the kid is deteriorating, you need to call your doctor, go to your doctor now, or go to the hospital and just ask, could it be sepsis? It's such a simple question. It is such a profound question. It could save a life. Could this be sepsis? Next, please. Early se sepsis detection saves lives and it limits disabilities. It's all about time. This is another acronym. I love this acronym. It's so easy. T, temperature is higher or lower than normal. I, infection. The person may have signs and symptoms of an infection. M, mental decline. The person may feel confused, sleepy, difficult to arouse. And E, extremely ill, an extremely ill person. You get the feeling of when somebody is extremely ill and you do the measurements and you do your examination. Severe pain, discomfort, shortness of breath. Ask. Time. Could this be sepsis? Go to hospital? No. Next, please. No. Sepsis always involves an infection. And it's not just an infection that gives you sepsis. It's se sepsis, and then it's the dysregulation of the entire immune system that leads to organ failure and death. So infection plus bad vitals is equal to sepsis. Can you remember that? Yes, you can. Infection plus bad vitals. Now, what are some bad vitals? We have the systemic um, inflammatory response score. And this, these criteria involve temperature, that's a vital, heart rate, and respiratory rate. These are three vitals. And then it also involves a lab figure. But suppose you don't have labs. You just have what you have in your office. You can do your temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate. So is the temperature more than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius? You're checking your heart rate. Is the heart rate more than 90? Is the respiratory rate more than 20? Those are bad vitals. That's the systemic inflammation root, um, response score. Now, sepsis will involve the serious criteria, plus you've got to have infection. Remember, infection plus bad vitals. So serious tell us, tells us about bad vitals. Uh, let's add in the infection. Do you suspect or have you identified a present source of infection? That's your sepsis criteria. And severe sepsis criteria, you have organ dysfunction, hypotension, hypo, hypoperfusion, um, which would be lactic acidosis. Then you may have um, the systolic blood pressure, which is less than 90, or the systolic blood pressure dropped 
and the drop was either equal to 40 or more than 40 millimeters of mercury of that person's normal blood pressure. So remember, sepsis is equal to infection plus bad vitals. Next, please. And then this will determine uh, the mortality. So you have SOFA score, sequential organ failure assessment score. Organ failure just ain't good. And so SOFA indicates the severity of organ dysfunction. What does SOFA evaluate? Respiration, coagulation, liver function, cardiovascular, central nervous systems, and renal. And that's going to involve quite a lot of tests, right? And that's usually in the hospital setting. But we can do a QSOFA, which is a quick sequential organ failure assessment score, because this is simple bedside criteria to quickly identify adult patients with suspected infection. It involves respiratory rate, which is greater than or equal to 22 breaths per minute. It involves an altered mental status. It involves systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury. The presence of any two of these criteria in a patient with known infection should prompt further evaluation for organ dysfunction. Remember, sepsis infection plus bad vitals. And what we saw in QSOFA, we saw some bad vitals plus altered mental status. Next, please. So let's do this case study. Now, this is a person who came to me in August. And anytime we see a patient, we need to ask, could this be sepsis? So this is Saturday afternoon, about two o'clock. Mrs. W called the office and she wanted an appointment um, for a sick husband. He needs the appointment, but she wanted, although the husband is sick, she wanted the appointment on her day off next week. Not on the Saturday, on the Wednesday. So the administrator said, what's happening? Mrs. W said, well, my husband is really unwell for the last two weeks and he's been coughing. And the administrator said, try cough. And then she heard him on the phone, that cough was so bad. She heard him coughing in the background. And then she said, ah, oh, it sounds like a wet cough. Bring him in now. So this is important. The front the, or first line person in our clinics recognize there's a problem. Bring the person in now. We cannot delay. Mr. W comes in about two hours later. He is a 70 year old man. He normally keeps in good health. He sleeps well until two weeks ago. The man is a non-smoker. He doesn't drink. He's a mechanic for these years. And he also sells mechanical car parts, spare parts. So his complaint um, is a coughing that brought up a lot of yellow cold. He has had no appetite. Oh, he can drink some soup and porridge, but he's been losing his sense of taste. There's been no vomiting. He has a fever. The top of his head feels sore. He has pain in the forehead. He has a headache. He feels unbalanced when he stands and his left knee hurts. Please note that he has inadequate support at home. Because when we're doing all of this, we found that the wife is traveling. This is Saturday, the wife is leaving the island on Monday. He has two grown up children at university. Mr. W is the one who normally takes care of everyone in the family. And the rest of the family is not used to taking care of Mr. W. So guess what? These people cannot take care of Mr. W right now. The home environment just is not safe. And then when we check it out, next slide please. On examination, we found the man is extremely ill. He's weak, he walks slowly, his mucosae are dry. When he talks, he has many bouts of coughing. <coughs> he is not as sharp as he was when he was well. He's using accessory muscles of respiration. He is distressed. His temperature is 39.5. When we check the pulse, I literally check the heart rate. 117 beats per minute. His blood pressure was 100 over 70. Respiratory rate, 22. S I did the SPO2, 93%. Remember the time acronym? Temperature, the man has a temperature? Mm -hmm. He has an infection? Uh-huh. Mental decline? Mm-hmm. And he's extremely ill? Uh-huh. My dear T-I-M-E, suspect sepsis. So just based, based on time, I could say suspect sepsis. 
All right, let's go to Sears and then add on the, um, the, the bad vitals, infection plus bad vitals. We saw bad vitals there, sepsis. And suppose we did the two so far. We found his respiratory rate was 22. He had mental decline and his systolic blood pressure was at 100. So remember, sepsis is equal to the Sears criteria plus the source of infection. He filled that because his temperature was 38, his heart rate was nine, more than 90, his respiratory rate was more than 20, and he had a lung infection. So diagnosis, sepsis, pneumonia, likely bacterial, and the man is quite dehydrated. So my plan, I explained to the man about sepsis, that this is not good, you've been home for two weeks, and this, these germs have been running around and causing trouble in your body. They are ready to shut down your organs. We need to get back up fast and you cannot do it at home. We need the team in the hospital so as to safeguard your lifetime. Right now, your lifetime is on the line. It's being cut short every moment you do not get the appropriate treatment. So we need to go to the hospital No, I told the wife because the man is dehydrated to go and get him a bottle of Gatorade and water. And I did a letter of referral to the university hospital and I put it straight in the man's hands. I said, this use, you, you are going to take it. Your wife will drive it to the hospital. You need to take this to the doctor. No, you're not going home. You're going straight to the hospital. At the hospital, you're going to do a COVID test and they're going to do further management and stabilize you so that you get better. Next slide, please. So, that was a Saturday, and then on Monday, I called um, a telephone number I had on the card, and the son answered. And he said that dad had got the Gatorade and was drinking it when he was admitted. And he spent four days in hospital. And, you know, university hospital don't admit for phone, right? So the man was well sick. They did a chest x-ray. They did a blood test. They put him on IV antibiotics, IV fluids. Mr. W said that while he was in hospital, he decided to walk up and down because he couldn't stand lying down in bed. Where they put him, he saw dead bodies passing him all the time and he couldn't take it, so he just walked up and down on the ward. He was discharged with a referral letter from the university hospital for continuation of care. The diagnosis on the referral from the university hospital was community acquired pneumonia, mild hyponatremia. What a good thing he was drinking the Gatorade. Query chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and were to rule out a non benign lesion and um, continue treatment. Um, well, he, he was on the Zinat, 500 milligrams every 12 hours, and Isithromycin, 250 milligrams once a day. And he was referred um, for continuation of care. Next slide, please. Next slide. And when I reviewed him, this is, um, this is about a week later, no, two weeks later. His cough was less and um, he had less cold now. When I examined him, his chest was clear. Assessment, this man had definitely improved. I continued with Zinat because he wasn't totally clear yet. I gave him another five days and I also started him on a probiotic enter germinal to help settle the bowels for five days. And then I followed up um, with a phone call one week later. He was feeling better and stronger, breathing better. His voice was happy and he was laughing. I advised him that he would need to get a flu vaccine and we need to do a CT of the chest. And, and he was to collect the CT chest request form from my clinic. Next, please. But he promised to come in, you know, he promised to come in on Wednesday, but I haven't seen him, so I need to call, call him up. So in summary, we need to ask, could this be sepsis? Sepsis in the community affects everyone. It affects families and it's going to affect everybody who goes to school. It doesn't matter from when you're born to when you are very old. It's very important to practice prevention, which is your hygiene, and also to do vaccination. Community awareness of sepsis is very important because if Mrs. W and her children had known this and they're very intelligent people, it's just too busy and not enough awareness put on other members of the family. They would have, act, they would have acted differently. So we really need to do this 
sepsis awareness in the schools, in the community centers. We need to talk to our patients about sepsis. Maybe we have a wall chart about the TIME and how they can recognize sepsis in time. Family doctors also need to be aware of sepsis. Remember, sepsis is infection plus bad vitals, right? And then you can do your, you can do your scoring. And it's very important to manage sepsis and we've got to do it quickly so that we save lives. Remember, SARS plus an infection and QSOFA, these will guide us. For further information, for further information, this is a very good site. Take a screenshot of this. UK Sepsis Trust for resources. You will get charts. They will um, give you charts on the National Early Warning Score. That's a new tool. The Pediatric Early Warning Score. They have the Maternal Early Warning Score. You know, they even have videos. They have games that children can play. Um, they have resources to share with schools so that the teachers can use to train the children to recognize sepsis. So early sepsis recognition and action saves lives. So let us all ask, could this be sepsis? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Buckland. Yet again, always passionate on the ball, bringing life, bringing reality to a very abstract situation. Now I'm very, very happy to introduce one of our colleagues from our Cave Hill campus, Dr. Makita Getten St. Hilaire, who is a senior lecturer in microbiology in the clinical department of fa uh, the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of the West Indies. And she's going to deal with a very important topic because we are the Caribbean Sepsis and EMR Alliance. And EMR is the year is basic and sepsis are yin and yang. You know, one, you have to use antibiotics to deal with sepsis, but at the same time, the use of antibiotics cause AMR. So how do we get that balance? And very important is the microbiologist. So I would like to pass over now to Doc Tegetin Sintele, who will deal with the diagnosing sepsis, the role of the microbiology laboratory. Over to you, Doc. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. So sepsis requires early intervention. It requires early diagnosis and a prompt implementation of treatment. And of course, you know, key to the diagnosis, key to the management of sepsis is the clinical microbiology lab. Why? Because we need to um, decide, in order to identify the infection, you need to have blood cultures. And so blood cultures have been historically used as the gold standard for diagnosing uh, septicemia. So what is sepsis? It's already been mentioned before, is a, and this very simplistic uh, definition here doesn't really cover it per se, but you know, it's, it says it's primarily caused by bacterial infections. Primarily, but doesn't mean it can't be caused by fungi, viruses, or uh, parasites. And it causes a dysregulated immune response, which can then result in organ dysfunction or failure. When we look at where persons mainly, uh, uh, the areas which are really infected, we would see the respiratory system. And in the previous uh, case, we would have seen the person didn't have a respiratory infection. So respiratory infections, gastrointestinal tract, genital urinary, skin and soft tissue infections account for more than 90%. And the primary organisms, as mentioned before, are bacterial but primarily gram-negative organisms, about 67%, and gram-positive organisms, about 47%. And some persons can have a mixture of both. The source of the infection is not always determined, so in about half of the patients, you will be able to determine where the source of the infection is, is, uh, um, is coming from, but in others, you aren't. And so the other half, you aren't. And these will be considered culture negative sepsis. The majority of culture negative sepsis will be found in persons with respiratory tract infections. And we know that respiratory tract infections are primarily caused by viruses. So that would go kind of hand in hand if we're talking about, you know, culturing and so forth. The urinary tract tends to be more culture positive because we have 
the Enterobacter raceae, the gram-negative organisms, being more associated with these infections. Here's an algorithm for uh, sepsis. So one of the primary things, of course, you need to suspect. And as mentioned before, we can use the type acronym, we can use the, uh, the sepsis acronym, we can use quick sofa, we can use SIRS, we can use status changes to identify that the person has sepsis. But the microbiology lab comes into two important areas. First, we're looking at the source. Where is the infection located, right? We need to identify where that is. And then, of course, we need to also take blood cultures and take any um, organ-specific cultures as well. Then, uh, within that hour, we also need to institute um, antibiotics. So whatever, and you know, for, for the particular uh, source or the particular area that's infected, we need to have our antibiotics being instituted. So the microbiology lab is important in, in those areas. So when we're looking at the diagnosis, it's important to look at the history. You take a detailed history, you take have a very good physical examination, and then you also need to incorporate the laboratory and microbiological testing, as well as the lab studies. Of course, we need to include in the lab studies a CBC with differential, you have to do your um, chemistries, and of course, then you need to incorporate, uh, very importantly, your bacterial culture. So first, it would be your blood cultures and any like, specific cultures, and then, you know, for example, your wound culture, sputum, and so forth would be needed. Then you can stain. Uh, for us in the, the microbiology field, it would be a gram stain or similar. Uh, for for the blood, that would be helpful in determining specific infections. Of course, it helps in determining the morphotype of the organism, uh, which would be important to start in empiric therapy. And then, it, of course, our urine studies. So urine analysis, your microscopy, urine culture, those are important. And then it's other biomarkers uh, for inflammation and so forth to help with, to determine the prognosis of infection and for early sepsis diagnosis. But those three, the blood cult, the bacterial cultures, the staining, and the urine studies are important in the microbiology lab. So blood cultures have long been recognized as the gold standard for definitive diagnosis of bacterial and fungal septicemia, and it's important to properly collect them and to transport them as well as the, you know, because because they're critical for isolation and identification of the organisms that will cause the septicemia. And we know that blood cultures generally consist, unless you're using a manual system of, uh, which would use just one tube um, of an aerobic and anaerobic um, blood culture bottles. One of the other important things, of course, is and I, I always mentioned by uh, the persons in the lab is that you don't want to have it contaminated. So you want to prevent contamination. So the most critical step in collecting a blood culture is to show you cleanse the site properly. It's always imperative that that is done because you don't want commensal flora or contaminating flora being introduced in the specimen because then you can get false positives. And so the sterile techniques are always required because you don't want that to happen. And so you also need to select the site for the blood culture um, to be collected. And it must be done by sterile techniques. And it you generally uses antiseptics that are different than if you're doing a routine venipuncture. So where does this contamination occur? And you can see along the continuum. If you don't adequately clean the puncture site, so the where you don't allow the anti um antiseptic to dry properly, uh, for dry to dry long enough, because it has to have time to actually eradicate the organisms on the surface, um, for it to 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 work, um, and it also need to decontaminate any equipment or specimen containers, and you shouldn't palpate the site um, after you've cleansed it. You also need to clean the, the collection vials as mentioned before. And you can clean the blood collection tube, the bottle by using 2% chlorhexidine in a 70% alcohol, isopropyl alcohol wipe 
or very similar, a similar mechanism can be used to clean the bottle, but you don't want to have a contaminated bottle um, either to introduce um, environmental flora into the sample either. So what we are talking about um, cleansing the site, you need to use a sterile technique. One of the previous recommendations was that you would use this concentric motion to be able to clean the site. But according to CLSI, which has now changed that recommendation, you're now using this scrubbing action, this back and forth scrubbing action. We can then cleanse it initially with an alcohol prep pad, and then you can follow on with one of these um, antiseptics. It may be one of these, or it may be one of the others. But one of the things that you also don't want to do is to blow on it um, after you've cleansed it, to palpate it, or anything like that. You don't want to contam contaminate the area at all. Did I forget a step? You need to wash your hands at all times and don gloves. So it's important um, to ensure that you yourself will not be transmitting any infections. But what's the cause of a contaminated specimen? We have commensal flora um, on our skin, which generally do not cause um, very severe infections at all. They really cause severe bloodstream or bacterial infections, but if it gets into a susceptible host, it's able to do so. And with that, then you can have unnecessary lab costs, unnecessary costs in terms of using um, antibiotics, right? Um, increased length of hospital stay. You can have additional patient measures, imaging and so forth. It can also increase the hospital stay by about one day. And you can increase um, the amount of antibiotics uh, by about 39%. So it becomes a very expensive venture after all. Uh, when you are taking your blood cultures, you need to know which blood, which bottles you need to use first. Um, if you're using syringe and line draws, you want to inoculate the anaerobic bottle first and then it's followed by the aerobic bottle. And if you're using the butterfly technique to withdraw the blood, then you in inoculate the aerobic bottle first and then this is followed by the anaerobic bottle. When you're taking your blood collections, we, I always tell the students it's best to take two blood cultures as opposed to one because suppose that first one became what was contaminated, right? So it is important to take two sets, which will consist of two bottles, an aerobic and anaerobic bottle um, from two different venue puncture sites, usually obtained within an hour. Um, depending on what the indication is, you know, you may take additional samples at other times. But, you know, for example, if you have an infective endocarditis, then they can be spaced one to two hours apart because you're looking for the continuous bacteremia. You want to say the person has, um, the, you know, the organism is circulating in the bloodstream continuously. Also, um, in when you are taking your blood cultures, not every organism is as sensitive as the other. So it depends on the sensitivity um, as well. So there are some organisms that, are very, that grow very well in these bottles. Uh, for example, E. coli or um, Staphylococcus aureus. But the sensitivity is usually lower for organisms like Pseudomonas and Streptococci or fungi. So that's why it's important to take more than one uh, blood culture set. Volume is important. So you need to optimally fill the vials to about, for, um, you need to add about 10 mils. Uh, to each bottle. So maybe about eight to 10 mils will be adequate. And for children, you need to collect no more than 1% of the total blood volume. If you underfill, then you can cause false negative uh, results. If you overfill, then you can have inaccurate results. So it's important to make sure to not use expired bottles, make sure the bottles are, um, the, the, the contents are clear and so forth. You don't want to have you know, anything that can affect the results. And you also want to ensure that the bottles are appropriately labeled. You don't want to cover the barcodes that need to, that the machine needs to be able to read and so forth. So you, you really need to be mindful when you are collecting your blood culture. So there's a 3% increase in sensitivity for every extra mil of blood collected. When we're transporting samples, as for all microbiology samples, we want to get them to the lab within two hours. You don't want to keep them for too long because a delay can result in false negative results. Now, 
where we get, now that you've collected your blood culture specimen and it has gone to the lab, you can, there are two ways in which you can detect the organism. You can do a, a conventional blood culture method or you can use uh, metagenomics. Now, most of us aren't on the metagenomic side, so I'll concentrate more on the conventional blood culture, where you will take the sample, it can be placed in the automated blood culture system, um, and once it's flagged as being positive, they can gram stain it, subculture it, identify it, either by a biochemical test or the molded off if you do have one, and then you go on to perform your antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Now, some of you would remember this, the manual blood culture systems, which would use, and this one is the oxide uh, but blood culture uh, bottles. There were, this one is, you just need one bottle and it's able to allow the growth of uh, both aerobic and anaerobic organisms. And this is the sleeve here. You will generally take that, once you've inoculated the vial, the blood culture medium, you will take the sleeve, attach it to the top and then as the organism grows, it releases um, gas and the gas forces the blood um, blood culture broth mixture into the sleeve at the top here. And that indicates that the organism is positive, that the blood culture is positive. And then you will take an aliquot of that and then you would gram stain it and then you will subculture it. But this tends to be more intensive because then you have to, you know, in the lab, you have to go and be rocking you know, agitating the vials and so forth. With the newer uh, automated systems, you don't have to do that, right? So you will take, you have your same blood culture vials, um, but you will put it in an automated blood culture system. Like your, so you have your BATEC or, or BATI alert systems. And these are ones where you would, in the same way, you would inoculate your blood into the vials, but then you will put it into the machine. And the machine is able to measure the amount of CO2 being released by colorometry or by fluorescence. And when that is detected, then uh, it is considered as positive, is removed from the machine, and then you can go on to the usual characteristic um, methods, um, which we will do your gram staining, and then you can follow all your subculturing, et cetera. So once you have a positive blood culture, uh, bottle is immediately reported to the physicians. They perform a gram stain and it's subcultured. The morphotype is submitted to the physician. And if it's not, um, if, if the gram stains are negative, then it is not reported unless you, there's growth on the, uh, on the subculture. So it's important to follow through on the identification of the organism and then this is also followed up by antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So here you can use the multi multi tough for that, or you can use your conventional methods. For subculturing, you will take some of the blood from the blood, the positive blood culture bottle, and you would inoculate it onto blood agar and chocolate agar. You would incubate it, and then you would wait for the you know for the bacterial colonies to develop, and then after that you would be able to identify the organism and then you would perform your antimicrobial susceptibility testing. For fastidious organisms are rarely implicated as uh, causes of uh, septicemia. Um, and in that instance, the blood cultures are usually kept for longer than seven days. Usually they aren't kept for longer than seven days, but if you suspect um, any fastidious organisms, then they can be kept for longer. And microbacterial cultures are usually incubated for about four weeks. For non-culturable organisms, you also um, these also don't necessarily cause um, a lot of infections either. So in the microbiology law courts, sepsis would always be bacterial until proven otherwise, and viruses will not be guilty. Um, they've been trying to determine, you know, the, this burden of disease and immortality associated with virus-induced sepsis. Uh, that has still to be elucidated, but it's important in terms of treatment, making sure you don't use antibacterial agents and making sure your infection control prevention measures are in place, and also uh, making sure that you can use the uh, specific time-sensitive antiviral agents as necessary. 
This one slide just shows the organisms and I'll focus primarily on A, B, and C. So this is from a study that was done in the US and the primary organisms as seen in the pie chart here in A uh, show that E. coli is the predominant organism causing these infections uh, followed by some others that are not identified. And then we have Klebsiella um, as the others. Uh, for your gram-positive organisms, you have Staphylococcus aureus, usually methicillin-sensitive, and then this is followed by methicillin-resistant, and then coagulase-negative. And then for fungi, yeast. Most of the times, yeasts are not speciated, so that's why they have it broadly as yeast. And then, of course, it comes to empiric therapy. You need to know where the source of infection is, because if you know where the source of the infection is located, then you can treat appropriately. So if it's intravascular lines, then you can have your gram positive organisms such as MRSA and you treat appropriately. For if you're gram negative organisms, you have you think about your nosocomial organisms, especially pseudomonas, and then you can use drugs such as preparacillin, tazobactam. For the bacillary tract infections, uh, because of where it's located, your enterobacter raci again and your anaerobes, as well as enterococcus. And then for your intra-abdominal and pelvic infections, it's very similar to the, bacillar, the biliary tract. So it's these kind of the same organisms and your carbapenem, spreprocillin, tazobactam, et cetera. For your sepsis, as we would have mentioned before, predominantly associated with your gram-negative organisms, your enterobacter aureci. For pneumococcal infections, it will be your third generation cephalosporins. And if you don't know where it's coming from, you know, you generally bring out the big guns, your carbapenems. So I just want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Doc. We have time for just one question at this point in time. In fact, we're out of time for any question, but I will still find out if there's one question. Um, oh. If there is any at all, I'm not seeing any coming up. Yes, there's a, a Karen Roy Green. Karen, you right. can ask me a question. Go right ahead, Karen. Which one of the presenters? Karen? I a question, but to tell everyone, thanks who have organized this. It's very informative. Very, you learn a lot of information by listening and doing. Um, inviting everyone to our webinars that we are having in the month of September, the 30th of September and the 1st of October. Also, we are having a conference on sepsis and mental health on the 29th of September. It's a hybrid conference and we look forward to participation from CSA members throughout. Th thanks very much, Dr. Ray Green. I would like to, to thank each and every one of our presenters who were fantastic. I think I didn't want to stop anybody, uh, even if it went a little over time, just would have notified them time was going on because I think the information was fantastic. We started off with the vulnerable group with Dr. Krishnamurti, who gave the current treatment, gave some background why this group is, is very vulnerable and the requirements for it. Dr. Uh, Aldit Buckland, as usual, gave a fantastic overview of how it presents itself in the community and how we deal with it. But more importantly, uh, we got some great insight and a lot of insight that I think even our medical students should get a review of this at some point in time. How do you deal with diagnosing sepsis in the lab and the role of microbiology, which was well done by Dr. As getting sent here. It was fantastic. I, I enjoyed every moment of it. So it, presenters, much thank you for this. For those who have joined us online, you will be getting your C, um, C, CME certificate. And thanks to Dr. Buckland for arranging that as well. You just ensure that you were online and you registered with your email, etc., so that we can get that over to you. And just to let you all know, I said sepsis and EMR are hand in hand. Our next event actually is on the 26th, uh, working with the Fleming Institute, whereby we will be dealing with EMR at the UN General Assembly. So stay tuned for more. 
look out for the Caribbean Sepsis Alliance page. It's all on Instagram. It's all on uh, Facebook. Uh, we didn't reach TikTokers yet, but it, you never know. We might reach there one day. But um, yeah, just to let you all know, that's where we at. And there are a lot more to come. Thanks very much, everyone. And this will hopefully be placed on YouTube as well in short order. Take care and have a good day.